I'm Patricia Cummings, and I'm going to talk about utilizing behavioral science to improve antibiotic prescribing, specifically how we implemented Mitigate in a large rural community hospital in Southern California. First, to give context, we are a 463-bed community teaching hospital with a number of residency and fellowship programs. We are located in Southern California in an area known as the Coachella Valley, which includes Palm Springs. There are many rural areas within the valley and we have a large older adult aging population, large HIV AIDS and MSM populations, as well as very high syphilis rates compared to the rest of the United States. In terms of context specific to this project, we were seeing high rates of antibiotic use in our urgent care locations, not only within our health system at the time, but also in the community across other urgent care centers in the area. So to confirm this, we created a query to establish our baseline rate. This was all part of a national push back in 2016 when Fleming Dutra et al. published their seminal report on inappropriate prescribing among U.S. ambulatory care visits, and that established the national rate at about 45%. As does much external federal and state policy and research, this report really gave us the impetus to start examining our own prescribing rates for acute respiratory tract infections. And when we saw it was above the national average, we decided to target our efforts in our urgent care clinics. So one of the key factors that drive any intervention, no matter where you are, is site readiness. Um, the main purpose of this slide is to show all the external and internal facilitators that we had to implement this intervention in our health system. The orange boxes are specific to our health system, and the blue boxes are national or state level policies, regulations, or guidance documents like the CDC core elements of outpatient antibiotic stewardship. The green boxes are key facilitators that specifically helped our antibiotic microbial stewardship program be successful with implementation. For example, here you can see the publication of the Mitigate Toolkit there on the bottom right in green, as well as a state collaborative that facilitated networking opportunities with colleagues that were experts in this area of research, um, specifically Dr. Larissa May and uh, Dr. Kabir Yadav. So how did we implement Mitigate? We started with getting our C-suite and departmental leadership on board. Then we worked on creating the database, validating the data, and analyzing it to establish our rates and ability to track trends over time. Personally, I have an epidemiology background, but you could have a PharmD or PharmD residents do this work, um, your infection prevention team, or another ASP team member. For other intervention components like patient education, we leveraged our nurse managers at each site to place the printed materials in plexiglass stands in the waiting room and patient rooms. However, I would say the majority of the work and time goes into creating the clinician feedback and peer comparison emails. This takes me about a few hours to do once a month and the time really depends on how many providers you have involved in the intervention. I also have someone conduct a cross check before the emails get sent out for accuracy. So to go in a bit more detail on the data side, our business intelligence created a SQL database using ICD-10 codes listed on the discharge summary in EPIC. This included inclusion and exclusion conditions that we obtained from the Mitigate Toolkit. For the emails, we adapted content from the Mitigate Toolkit, which provides templates. We then sent them to individual providers as well as group uh, email with a color-coded blinding ranking so they could see where they stand against their peers. Um, and that's pictured on the left, the blinded ranking. This really helped to drive competition among providers. So the bottom line is the um, Mitigate Toolkit really gave us everything we needed to implement the intervention. Now here are the intervention results. The green bars show the number of prescriptions written for ARI, and the blue bars show the number of ARI encounters or encounter count. And then the blue line there shows the percentage of antibiotics written for ARI. This metric is simply the number of prescriptions written for ARI divided by the number of ARI encounters for each month. Once the intervention was implemented, you can see the large decline over time. And we uh, conduct conducted an interrupted time series analysis so you can see the 16-month pre-intervention solid black line compared to the six-month intervention dash line at our urgent care clinics from 2017 to 2019. And the reduction was statistically significant. So just looking at crude counts here, we had a reduction from 73% at baseline compared to 59% during the intervention, and we were, published these results in OFID. 
One other piece of data I want to mention um, is we use patient satisfaction surveys. We got very few patient complaints over the intervention period, but here you can see two examples. The first said, you know, there appears to be this overriding fear of prescribing antibiotics that has truly pervaded our care facilities. You know, I was tested for strep and was negative, and they go on. The second patient said, you know, I was denied a prescription because I was told it was viral. I was given a Z-Pack last year. So we really use these um, to gauge patient provider communication, and we saw it as a positive on the provider side. So the main lessons learned from implementing this intervention include patient um, provider communication. So we uh, initially gave providers um, symptom relief prescription pads, and we got them for free from the California Department of Public Health. And the providers ultimately did not like them because they wanted something integrated within um, the EHR. Uh, we use Epic. And they wanted it to be electronic so that it could be printed out as part of their AVS, or after visit summary. Um, providers did feel, however, that giving a patient something makes them feel like they've been treated. Um, so this can improve patient satisfaction. The second thing is identifying the best forms of provider communication for the feedback emails prior to the intervention. Um, for example, personal versus work emails. Um, and this may also vary across departments and specialties. Um, the third is provider visit volumes can vary, so making sure you have enough volumes for peer comparison to make it meaningful. We um, excluded providers with less than 10 ARI visits per month. We also conducted a physician survey using SurveyMonkey pre-intervention that collected information on prescribing behaviors, and we found this to be an effective way to gather data quickly. Lastly, during the intervention, we found it useful to promote the message to providers that feedback emails were not meant to be punitive, but rather educational. So just want to say special thanks to our team who helped us with this work and thank you for your time.